to everyone. To those that are in the sanctuary, we thank God for you being here in, your, in God's presence today. And for those of you that are on Facebook, we thank you for taking out the time to fellowship with us. We had a marvelous time last week, and we look to continue this tonight. The person that will be bringing the word to us tonight is Sister Fallon Allen, and I will let her come in her own way. Sister Allen. Um, if you would turn with me to Luke 7, we're going to, uh, I'm going to cover verses 36 through 50. So that's Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. And as you find that, I'm going to say a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you as humbly as I know how. Asking for your forgiveness of all my sins committed against thee, restore my upright relationship with you, that I may deliver your word to your people in spirit and in truth. Lord, I put on the whole armor of God that you may increase and I decrease, and you receive all the honor and glory for this message I give on tonight. Lord, please touch your people to be able to see this word individually, and all these things I ask and pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so if you all have Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immortal woman from the city heard that they, he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell, fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting, on, putting perfume on them. Then the Pharisee who had invited him saw this. He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him, for she is a sinner." Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to another, but neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts, who do you suppose he loved more? Who, who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one of them whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he returned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust off my feet. But she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who has forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said amongst themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Amen. And so to give some background about this text, uh, the religious leaders, they hated both John and Jesus. Um, you know, they didn't have a consistent reason of why they hated them, right? They couldn't find any fault in either one of them. And so it basically kind of gives you an idea, you know, when you hear people say, I can't stand that person, right? 
And you think to yourself, well, why can't you stand that person? I don't know. It's just something about them. Right? And so, as they criticized John the Baptist and Jesus, they criticized John because, you know, it was certain he fasted all the time, right? He didn't drink wine. They criticized Jesus because of what he ate. And it wasn't so much about what he ate, but it was who he ate it with. Jesus hung out with the tax collectors. He hung out with the sinners, right? And so, because of those things, that's what really upset the Pharisees, right? Because it made them feel like hypocrites, right? It convicted them in a sense. And so the Pharisees weren't really troubled by that because you know what? We all tend to uh, validate why we do what we do, right? <laughs> so they, they, they were religious minded, right? So they always had a justified reason for doing wrong or sinning. They always had a reason to twist the word and make it apply to what they wanted to have done. And I mean, I find compelling reasons as well too, right? I mean, I'm gonna talk about me, you know, and depending on who we're talking to, they will validate those reasons, right? I don't study my word every day, but depending on who I'm talking to, girl, don't worry about that. You got a husband, four kids, God know your heart. You don't have to do that. But really, to be honest, that's all the more reason why I need to stay in my word, if I be honest, right? And so, you know, and, you know, some might say, well, you don't read your word every day. Well, why are you up here giving Bible study tonight, right? But I line my life up with the word of God. And so I know that he says meditate day and night, right? So I'm, I, I, I'm, I know that every day I have to kill my flesh, so that I can make the correct choices, right? And so as, so, you know, to just give that context and to give a, a little bit about the backdrop of this, you know, uh, stories because, again, we all don't read our Bibles. Well, some of us, let me correct myself. So I just wanted to make sure that I gave that backdrop of how this, uh, this context works or this, this scripture works. And so my message and the title of my message tonight is, Who Are Your Pharisees? Okay, so in verse 36, one of the Pharisees asked din Jesus to have dinner with him. And that lets me know that Jesus had several haters because context shows that they hated them, right? It says it in the word, not Fallon word, but God's word. The Pharisees hated John and Jesus. And so it said one of the Pharisees, so that let me know it was many, right? And I know we've been there, done that, right? Sometimes we feel some kind of way when people don't like us, one person don't speak, they don't invite us somewhere, right? We feel some kind of way about that, but be mindful, the Lord might be, you know, holding you accountable so you won't run into a Pharisee, right? Yeah. So just keep that in mind. And... um. As I was watching Minister McIntyre's uh, celebration concert, I heard uh, one of the women or a choir singing about the woman with the alabaster box. And so the Lord gave me that text and I'm thinking that I'm gonna talk about this woman, right? Who had all these sins and God saved her and all of that. Cause typically when we, when you hear this, the scripture about this, it's always focused on the woman. But the Lord said, no, I want you to actually talk about the Lord and the Pharisees. And he gave me that, you know, who are your Pharisees? And so um, the I, I, he gave me some nuggets, y'all. So I'm sharing with y'all. The first nugget is one of the Pharisees who invited Jesus to his house for dinner was a hater, right? Because it says that. So I got to make sure that, again, I put that thing in perspective because for those of us, you know, who too busy to read and listen to the word, like pastors say all the time, the word is available. They got it everywhere, right? So we should be able to listen to it. Um, but again, I'm not going to be hypocritical on tonight, you know. Um, and so I know who my Pharisees are, right? Um, but in saying that, he always wanted to let them know that
You know, in verse 39, when he says the Pharisees who invited him saw himself, right? If, if you turn with me, it says the Pharisee who had invited him saw this when the woman was kneeling and wiping. Uh, she was crying and washing her, his, uh, her, his feet with her hair. He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. And in verse 40, then Jesus said and answered Simon. He said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. So did y'all notice any indication in, in the two scriptures that I said? Did y'all notice any real distinct words? Anybody? Okay, I'm going to tell you. He said that the Pharisee thought these things to himself. It didn't say that he said those things. He thought those things, right? And then it said that if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman it is. So if you think about a person, if y'all have ever heard a person say, oh, she thinks she all that. Oh, he think he got it going on. Is it really him or her that thinks that, or is that you? That's a strong indicator. If you didn't know who your Pharisees are, if you hear that, that's a strong indicator. They might be a Pharisee. Okay? And so, not only does the Pharisee have negative thoughts towards Jesus, but he doesn't even respect him enough to call him by his name. He said, if this man knew what type of woman she was, right? So not if Fallon or if Gerard or if whoever, right? They don't give you the respect and put respect on your name. Oh, she, he, they, him, right? So that's another indicator, y'all. Be mindful if you don't know who your Pharisees are. And so they say things like, oh, keep my name at your mouth. Why would they say keep your name, my name, or your, their name at your mouth? Because they're not going to give respect enough to say your name. They won't mention your name, but they'll mention about you. But never mention your name. And these are just, again, these are some legs that, you know, that one was extra. So, you know, it shows, but I'm, I'm going to show y'all in the next scripture, like, how awesome my big brother and my savior Jesus is, right? Because I'm going to give you his reply. In verse 40, Jesus answered his thoughts, Right? He answered his thoughts. He said, Simon, and he called him by name. Simon, he said, I have something to say to you. So they'll think one thing and say another, but they will never say your name, right? And not only that, they'll act on it. But Jesus answered. He came and he approached him directly in love. He went, oh, Simon. You know, he don't say he gave all the extra, right? But he said, Simon, I have a question to ask you, right? And so, and, uh, and, and I'm just going to uh, project down to uh, what the reply was. And he said, yes, teacher, um, go ahead. And G then Jesus said, a man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 to another. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly gave them both, uh, forgave them both and canceled their debt. So who do you think loved them more? And Simon, of course, as I paraphrase, said, the one who forgave uh, the, the larger debt. And so here, you know, again, to give some background about this, the Pharisee, who now we know name is Simon, had several social errors, several no-nos that he shouldn't have done. The first one was he neglected to wash Jesus' feet, which is a courtesy that's extended because sandals got very dirty, right? It, that was the first thing that he did that was insulting uh, outside of, you know, not calling him um, by his name and addressing him, right? The second thing was he didn't anoint his head with oil, right? And he didn't even offer him a kiss as, greet as a greeting when he came into the dinner. So if we think about if we were ever invited to someone's event, right? Dinner, what have you. And what is the custom to do? You greet the person at the door, right? You greet them. You welcome them. You show them where to put their coat, 
most importantly, you show them where the food at. Because that was what they came for. We came to eat, right? So you don't dismiss them. You don't say, hey, go open the door for so-and-so. I heard they at the door. Like, you come and you welcome them in. That is a custom, right? Because if someone was to address you like that, if you came to their event, you're not going back anymore, right? Especially if you ain't like the food. You might go back if you like the food. But, you know, you, you, you wouldn't come back because of the custom. And that's custom. That's tradition, right? And that's what he failed to do. Simon failed to do those things. So the question now is, why did Simon fail to do those things? Why did he fail to do them? Perhaps... He felt that he was too good for Jesus, right? Uh, he was trying to simply be, re, be real subtle about a put down, like he was trying to be shady, right? Have you ever went to an event and then somebody just invited you somewhere just to show off? Oh, girl, come to my house. I'm having dinner. Just so you could see their brand new furniture, <laughs> right? So you could see their new shiny pots and pans and their custom kitchen and all of that. That's really why they invited you. Or they wanted you to see that they rub elbows with higher up people. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you might, they don't know you, but they know me. Like, you know, just to make you feel insignificant, right? But you got to think about why would they do that? So the third thing is, you know, he didn't respect Jesus. Because if you were to respect me, you wouldn't have been thinking negative about me, for one. For two, you would have addressed me by my name. And for three, you would have done the customs that you're supposed to do when you invite someone to your house. Amen. And so, Jesus, he, uh, his reply was that, you know, if... You have given, been forgiven of a lot of sins. You would love all the more, right? But if you have someone who is self-serving or self-righteous, they really don't feel like Jesus, uh, you know, saved them of this. I saved myself, right? I woke up myself. Like pastors say, you know, that's credit fraud. You know, you didn't wake yourself up this morning. You didn't drive yourself down that street. You didn't protect yourself from getting hit by a car. Me and my baby got hit by a car. Flipped four times. We didn't save ourselves out of that car accident. You see what I'm saying? We could have went over the curb and been submerged in the water on the other end where the firefighter said he was glad that we did not do. Because had we flipped one more time. Hello? So we have to be mindful of those things. Right? And so when you... Do a lot for somebody, and they feel like, oh, that, well, that wasn't nothing. You don't know what it took for that person to give you that little bit of nothing, right? So be mindful, because that person could be a Pharisee, right? You have to know who your Pharisees are. And if you don't know who they are, pray about it. Ask God to show you. Don't be mad what the answer is now. Thank God that he, was, he loved you enough to reveal that to you. That's right. right? Amen. So the, the Pharisee's answer was, you know, the person that forgave the most or, or, or that, that was forgiven the most, but yet he felt like he said, that's why that woman did everything she did for me. Leave her alone. She's preparing me for something greater. You don't see value in me. You think you know me, but you don't really know me, Amen. right? And so as I um, take my seat, y'all, I just want you to, again, be mindful of your Pharisees are. And it says that overflowing love is a natural response to forgiveness and the appropriate consequence, uh, the appropriate sequence of faith. So when a person knows that you did much for them, they do much for you, Right? You can't outgive or out love somebody, but you can show them, I support, I appreciate you. I support you. I'm there where you can. And in all things, sometimes you might not be able to give something monetary, but you could be a service. That's right. That's right. You could give your time. Right. I mean, but time is money, okay? Yes. Like it's in its value, and you don't get it back. No. So just be mindful of who your Pharisees are. I thank you for your time. And I will take my seat. God bless you.